He also criticized politicians for distorting and devaluing research evidence that shows alcohol, tobacco, cocaine, and barbiturates to be more dangerous than cannabis, LSD, and the MD and MDMA. Okay. Now this study was titled the No Fucking Shit Study. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, a few quick things before we jump into the new episode you're about to check out here. Uh, as you may notice, there are some uh, laughs that you hear in the backdrop, and that is because this episode was filmed in front of a live virtual audience over Zoom. Uh, these shows happen once a month, and if you want to be a part of the live virtual audience, you can do so by grabbing tickets to one of the upcoming shows uh, right now. They happen on the last Friday of every single month, and it's a new show every time that involves some um, storytelling and, of course, the socially conscious comedy that you guys uh, are, are about to enjoy in, in just a few minutes. And sometimes there will be some special guests kicking the show off, so it's something that you guys don't want to miss. So if you want to grab tickets, you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. And that's pretty much the one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. So if you enjoy these videos and you want to check out more things that I have put out there, uh, you can check out my live stand-up comedy albums. You can check out uh, all of the past episodes of this show, uh, my interview podcast, Taboo Table Talk, and join us on the live streams uh, when I stream on Mondays through Wednesdays and Fridays at 12.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. So again, go check everything out at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. All right, now onwards to the episode. Now, one of the things the war on drugs is trying to prevent is addiction and overdoses especially when it comes to, you know, any any kind of drug. But instead of asking what drives a person to get addicted to anything and then commit crimes to feed those addictions, America's criminal justice system just puts you in prison for a public health concern. And look, Joe Biden himself has said that he doesn't care about the reasons why someone would commit a crime based on addiction. It doesn't matter whether or not the person that is accosting your son or daughter or my son or daughter, my wife, your husband, my mother, your parents, it doesn't matter whether or not they were deprived as a youth. It doesn't matter or not whether or not they had no background that enabled them to have, to uh, become a, a social, uh, become socialize into the fabric of society. It doesn't matter whether or not they're the victims of society. The end result is they're about to knock my mother on the head with a lead pipe, shoot my sister, beat up my wife, take on my sons. So I don't want to ask what made them do this. They must be taken off the street. Boy, that speech escalated real quick, huh? Damn. Like his drug addict son. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, uh, there's a lot of irony in this one clip. But hey, why try to understand the problem and come up with viable, humane solutions when you can just sweep them under the rug? Or in this case, <laughs> sweep them into a 4x4 four four cell with abhorrent conditions based on your racist-fueled fear. <laughs> but look, here's the reality, right? Most people have misunderstood addictions for a very, very long time. Psychologist Gabor Mate, who has worked with addicts in Vancouver during their drug epidemic, points out how addiction is a response to trauma. But addiction is not a choice that anybody makes. It's not a moral failure. It's not an ethical lapse. It's not a weakness of character. It's not a failure of will. 
which is how our society depicts addiction, nor is it an inherited brain disease, which is how the medical tendency is to see it. What it actually is, it's a response to human suffering. And all these people that I worked with have been severely traumatized as children. And not only is that my perspective, it's also what the scientific and research literature shows. So addiction then is actually, rather than being a disease as such or a human choice, it actually is, it's an attempt to escape suffering temporarily. In other words, the addiction wasn't your problem. Your problem is that you had a lot of emotional pain, you didn't know what to do with. So the addiction was really an attempt to solve a problem. So when you say, why do people use substances or why do they engage in addictions in general, it's because they have a problem they don't know what to do with. And our current criminal justice system and policies turn addiction into a crime. So then you take these traumatized people and you make their habit illegal. It's not illegal to drink yourself to death. It's not illegal to make yourself sick with emphysema or lung cancer by means of cigarettes, but it's illegal to use other substances. So now you take these abused, traumatized people, you place them outside the law, you put them in jails, and you hound them all their lives, treating them like criminals and bad people and, and failures and rejects and less than a human. And then we wonder how come they don't get better. So it's a self-perpetuating cycle of taking traumatized people and then re-traumatizing them and then hoping at the same time, why don't they listen? Why don't they get better already? Why don't they give it up? Based on the conditions of our prisons and the laws put into place by Joe Biden's crime bill, the prison system only creates more trauma. And since the prison system is more focused on recidivism than rehabilitation, these folks are more likely to turn to their addictions as a mean to cope with that trauma. So trauma becomes a commodity for the prison industrial complex and champions like and it's champions like Biden and Clinton and Obama and Harris and a bunch of other people that sit on our current Congress. And nothing furthers this illegal criminalization of humanity's attempt to heal from trauma than the scheduling system put into effect by Richard Nixon at the start of this war on drugs. But the scheduling system is flawed and based on unscientific research. So let's look at this from the bottom up here, right? Schedule 5 are substances that have a low addiction risk but can be used to make more addictive drugs. These are things like Robitussin, for example, right? And now, you know the government hasn't figured out what whippets are because if they did, they would make whipped cream a Schedule 5 substance, right? Which, which would only cause panic amongst basic bitches who like their pumpkin spice latte with extra whipped cream. <laughs> now, Schedule 4 drugs are pharmaceutical-grade drugs like Xanax, Valium, Ambien, Tramadol, which all sound like they'd be names of ships on Star Trek. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> now, Schedule 3 substances have a low addictive risk, but have a high addictive potential. Right? This includes stuff like uh, anabolic steroids, ketamine, codeine, and testosterone. Yeah, that's right. Human beings produce a Schedule Three drug. It's a heady, heady it, drug. Yeah, it's a very heady drug, right? This means that every teenage boy is a walking, talking, masturbating Schedule Three drug. Most of what makes up a teenage boy is testosterone. <laughs> That's about it. But don't worry, you guys. Don't worry. Congress is working on a bill to regulate ejaculations to ensure that we won't abuse this drug. All right. It's called the Harry Palm and God Sadness Act of 2021. <laughs> it's going to work. But yeah, but some people are really calling it the Buzzkill Act of 2021. Am I right? Huh? <laughs> you guys get it. You guys see what I'm doing. OK, now central two substances are the ones with a high addictive risk and are considered dangerous. This includes cocaine, methadone, fentanyl, Adderall, Ritalin, and oxycodone. That's right. 
most pharmaceutical companies deal Schedule II substances. In fact, Purdue Pharmaceuticals illegally flooded the market with Oxy to turn a profit from people's pain. Oxy has devastated low-income communities all across the nation, and there are very few Oxy peddlers in prison. And if they are, they're in some white-collar prison where you still get to manage your legal DEA cartel with tax breaks. They get fun tax breaks, you guys. Now, on to Schedule One substances. These are ones with a high addictive risk and abuse potential with no medical purposes. Okay, this includes cannabis, LSD, MDMA, and peyote. And this has no merit in science at all. But it does have merit in Nixonian magic. Okay? Which, if you're keeping track, is less credible than a birthday party magician. <laughs> now, Oxy has a higher abuse potential than cannabis, and we've seen it run rampant across the nation. Cannabis, oh, yeah, cannabis has a point zero 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 one percent addiction rate. There have literally been zero deaths related to cannabis, yet it is considered one of the most addictive and dangerous drugs based on propaganda and paranoia. Virtually every drug on the Schedule 1 list has medical purposes. Across Absolutely. the United States, state after state has started to legalize marijuana for medical purposes. And with the research they've been able to do, we now know that cannabis strains can be helpful for chronic pain, anxiety, depression, seizures, epilepsy, and they help you tolerate a Zack Snyder slow motion fest for more than 38 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it also makes you 96% less of an asshole too, which is, mm. that's huge. We've never seen numbers like that before. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful numbers. It's, yeah, it's, a be it's, a be it's an amazing plant. It's a pretty rad plant, you guys. But not only this, okay, not only all of this, but one of its major ingredients from cannabis can actually prevent the transmission of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Now, according to studies conducted at the University of Chicago, epithelial lung cells treated with cannabidol, or CBD, prevents the spikes of the virus from attaching to lung cells to replicate and spread. This means smoking or ingesting cannabis is an effective cure to stopping the pandemic. CBD has been known to have antiviral properties. And right now, if we legalize cannabis for recreation and medical purposes all across the nation, we can probably put an end to the pandemic in the time that it takes to watch a Speed Racer movie. <laughs> The plot of which only makes sense when you are high. And yes, I've done the research. <laughs> I watched it sober and it was very confusing. <laughs> and quite frankly, dangerous. Those people should not be going at those speeds. Okay. Mm. But when I was stoned, I was like, all of this makes sense. I get it. <laughs> Look at the colors, would you just, they're speaking to you. It makes it. <laughs> Look, this also, this also prevents the cytokine storm, which it makes the uh, patient's immune system attack healthy cells, right? This is how cancer works. The cytokine storm is basically the stop hitting yourself function of uh, viruses and, and cancer cells. That's pretty much what they do. They cause your body to just go, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, <laughs> and then death. <laughs> now, THC, CBD, and hemp oil have also been known to be anti-cancer agents and have helped decrease seizures as well. And look, it, this doesn't mean that everybody needs to go and start smoking weed today, al although it might help and create a better society with a lot more chill people and like, <coughs> way less real wars. But, but it does mean that you can get CBD pills and tinctures at various retailers across the country none of which are sponsors of the show, so I don't really feel like I need to mention some of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And look, CBD doesn't get you high, but it will help you with COVID-19 and it will decrease anxiety and pain relief. And it means right now we have a president who is willing to deny this cure for the sake of big pharma, big prisons, and health insurance company stock prices and lining his own damn fucking pockets. Okay, Biden and Harris are choosing to lead by fear and racism and profits over science and logic, which is exactly what they said that they were going to lead by. Now, back in 2009, the United Kingdom fired its chief drug advisor, David Nutt, for saying MDMA wow. and LSD are far less dangerous than alcohol. And it's true. Okay, when I'm drunk, I am loud, I am boisterous, and sometimes I want to call my exes and bullies to let them know that I'm better than them. <laughs> <laughs> and there are some people in the audience that can attest that. <laughs> but sh but shouldn't because we're doing a show. <laughs> but when I when I was on LSD, I forgot that I have a phone and I was more focused. <laughs> I was far yeah. more focused on how we are all molecules differing through the universe trying to get home to that singular point that created us all. It's beautiful. It was awesome. Professor Nutt, which Yes, I understand that that sounds like the Tyler Perry version of the Nutty Professor franchise. Fully aware of it. But Professor Nutt acknowledged that there are low psychological ramifications for cannabis use. It turns out that your brain on drugs isn't a scrambled egg, but a scrambled egg does sound good when your brain is on drugs. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. <laughs> Especially if there's salsa. Especially oh, if there's salsa, God. yeah. <laughs> He also criticized politicians for distorting and devaluing research evidence that shows alcohol, tobacco, cocaine, and barbiturates to be more dangerous than cannabis, LSD, and the MD and MDMA. Okay, now this study was titled the No Fucking Shit Study. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people didn't like the name of it, but the scientists felt very strong <laughs> to, to name it that. <laughs> Now, David Nutt also pointed out one of the major flaws in the relationship between science and politics, right? He said politics is politics and science is science, but there's a bit of tension between them sometimes. And science and politics tried dating, but politics just kept gaslighting science <laughs> to, to help out its friend criminal justice, right? <laughs> Look, science needs to break up with politics permanently and go back to doing what it does best, which is help people live their lives much better than they already are. And we also need to figure out how to make X-Men. That's... <laughs> That's why we keep scientists around. <laughs> but because of their Schedule One status, it's difficult for researchers in the United States and parts of Europe to do their jobs. But that doesn't mean that people aren't trying to use these drugs to help themselves when the so-called conventional medications fail, right? People like psychologist Dr. James Fadiman, AKA the godfather of microdosing, have actually written about how, how to microdose and the effects of it. Fadiman began his research on these substances in the 1960s. He says that the purpose of microdosing is not mind-bending intoxication, but the enhancement of normal functionality. Microdosing is far and away the most boring form of consuming psychedelics. No visions, no angels, no being uh, eaten by snakes, uh, no seeing all of your relatives for 15 generations, no becoming one with all humanity and with all matter, and finding that you are part of divinity. High doses are different worlds this and are scary and take preparation <laughs> and take a full day out of your busy life. Microdosing is something that you do as part of your life. It doesn't interfere, it actually Im improves your normal behavior. But there is no conclusive clinical evidence to support Fadiman's claims. He recommends that a microdose should be taken only once every three days so that the body doesn't develop a tolerance for the drug. Now, microdosing is using a very small amount of the drug 
to help improve certain functions that were otherwise impeded. The goal of people that microdose with LSD are self-realization and prioritization. They use between 10 to 15 micrograms of liquid LSD and mix it with ice cubes or coffee or some other type of drink, right? And microdosers have noticed that their senses improved and they were more sensitive to a lot of these things. And they also got an energy boost and improved their concentration, which is pretty awesome. Now, as James Fadiman mentioned, you don't want to microdose all the time. You take it for a week or two, and then you take a little break for a while, and then come back to it. This is not the way addictions work, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> nobody, so yeah, nobody is out there trying to suck your dick for a microdose. <laughs> <laughs> So for the DEA and other drug enforcement organizations to classify these drugs as addictive is scientifically wrong, which means that their classifications are based on ignorance and the machinations of several paranoid racist dudes and one lady that is very unfamiliar with Tupac. <laughs> it's, it's a Kamala Harris reference. <laughs> yeah. Now, in Switzerland, there are researchers looking into the effects of LSD on subjects, right? They gave one group a placebo and another group a full dose of LSD. At the Psychiatric University Hospital in Zurich, researchers are studying the effects that this drug has on the human body. Test participants are given a full dose of LSD, not a microdose, and the medical staff monitors their reactions. Holy fuck! They've found that the drug changes more than sensory perceptions. We've observed changes in mood, emotional perception, and self-perception. The participants have more empathy. They also experience less social anxiety. That is, they don't feel like they're being ostracized. After the test subjects ingest a dose of LSD, they undergo an MRI brain scan. Analysis of these scans indicates that the drug changes communication patterns among various regions of the brain, including activity and networking in areas where such exchanges rarely take place. LSD seems to affect the way we think and our emotions and self-perceptions. LSD is connecting different parts of the brain that don't talk to each other, which is kind of fucking awesome to me. Right. Uh, moving forward, MDMA and psilocybin are actually given to trauma victims along with therapy to help address their traumas. We've learned something new. Preliminary studies indicate that one or two doses of psilocybin can, over a period of three to six months, help to reduce depression symptoms. In a recent study, 60 patients who suffer from intermediate-level depression took part in a study on the effects of psilocybin. 30 test subjects were actually given the drug, the others a placebo. Their reactions were constantly monitored by a therapist in case the psilocybin brought back traumatic memories. One of the main effects of psychedelics is that they blur one's perception of the external environment. There's a loss of the sense of self and of inhibitions, and this allows people to interact more effectively with others. Of course, it all depends on the dosage. Yeah. Pretty awesome. And look, this is, this is exactly what these drugs do. Right? They help people move forward from their daily traumas that we face under capitalism. They help us live fulfilling and more meaningful lives by helping us connect with ourselves, each other, and the planet. And you can get the same effect from not microdosing, but that road is much harder to travel and definitely has way less colors. But both roads do follow the band Fish on tour for some reason. Science hasn't been able to figure that part out. <laughs> Look, the reason why it'd be harder is because we'd have to change the entire way we live our lives, right? We'd have to eliminate capitalism, change how we view our relationships with each other and work and nature that surrounds us, 
we'd have to give up profits and focus more on bettering ourselves and be being stewards of the planet. But if that was the case, then how would we sell boner pills and age-defying serums to people? <laughs> it's crazy, you guys. Crazy. Look, addictions are a result of trauma, and the current criminal justice system is making these addictions and their solutions illegal. Then imprison us for and make us lepers in society, compounding that trauma, leading to more addictions and more illegality. It's just a vicious, never-ending cycle. But there is a break from it, and it's in fully legalizing these drugs. Learning what they can do uh, creates a positive impact on our minds, consciousness, and our day-to-day -day lives. Gabor Mate points out how we all live with lots of emotional pain, and we don't know what to do with it. Instead of criminalizing the consequences of emotional pain, maybe we use these drugs as the tools they were intended for and escape the cycle of trauma caused by this never-ending war on drugs. The end. <laughs> oh, Chris, great <laughs> Thank show. Thank you for hanging out. Thank, Thank you, you, man. Guys. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. You guys are awesome. <laughs> And that has been your Forkful of Noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure that you hit that like button and hit that share button. Get the word out uh, on YouTube and Facebook. This kind of content is pretty often suppressed and sometimes even gets deleted from their site. So it's very important that uh, you guys hit the like and the shares. That always helps us uh, find new viewers on the algorithm and if you're trying to subvert censorship the best place to do that is rockfin uh, rockfin is the blockchain cryptocurrency video platform site that is all about helping content creators earn an income from what they create and there's absolutely no censorship on that platform so if you want to follow me on rockfin you can follow me at uh, rockfin.com slash krishmohan haha and if you want much more content, uh, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, you can find all of my stand-up comedy albums there. You can find past episodes of this show. Uh, if you missed a live stream, they're up on the website there. You can catch past episodes of my interview podcast, Taboo Table Talk. And you can make a donation. If, you, if you're on stable financial ground and you want to help support the show financially, you can do so directly on my website by making either a one-time donation, which acts as uh, you know, some super chats, uh, as it were, or you can become a sustaining member, which gets you free tickets to the virtual and when live comedy comes back, live comedy shows, as well as additional bonus content, which includes stand-up comedy shows. Uh, and you can ask me questions uh, and and leave comments for me as, um, as a sustaining member as well. So once again, you can go do that over at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -A -H -A. Thank you very much for tuning in, and there will be a new episode next week, so stay tuned. Thanks, guys. <laughs>